Hi, um, I'm Tommy, and thank you guys for having me, the Hunter Museum of Art, uh, for having us. This is really like such an incredible space. I had a, a fun time walking around today. Um, and oh, I'm just going to get started. Um, so I started photographing um, when I lived in Memphis. I grew up, I was born and raised in Memphis, and uh, I went to Memphis College of Art for my undergrad and then ended up uh, having a semester in New York City where I created a lot of the work that I'll be showing you. Um, that um, First and foremost, I uh, work in durational long-term projects. I m don't believe a project necessarily ends and oftentimes I find myself working on like multiple bodies of work um, at a at any period. Um, this is, I forgot I added music to this. It's my favorite song right now. Um, this is uh, from my first uh, body of work called Return to Sender. It turns 10 years old this year. Um, and I made these pictures uh, as one of like, like one of the first instances I, I started photographing myself. Um, it was in 2010, and Tina Segal uh, was doing a major show at the Guggenheim, and Marina Abramovic was doing it, her major retrospective show, The Artist is Present at MoMA, and I never, like being from Memphis, I was never exposed to that kind of um, art before. And right now, I just did like a, uh, maybe this video, maybe? Um, I have to click it one more time. And so finally last year, I've had the uh, opportunity to showcase this work. And so they often um, take the form of these four by six drugstore prints and often mounted without a frame around them. And uh, I've been finding new ways to present them that relates back to photography. Um, they're all done at night, um, long exposures. There's no flash or anything. And that yeah, was a good excerpt for that. So, um, and that's one of the installation. And on the left, you see is a, a, a adhesive vinyl print that I started folding um, my work during these um, exhibitions as a new way to like look at the same image but differently. I'm really like just been interested in trying to look at the things I've done and how to transform it outside of the photograph itself. And this is just a silent video that goes through my first uh, kind of book that I did through Ain't Bad. They're based out of Savannah, Georgia. Um, this is a uh, work that I m use as a template for a lot of what I was doing. And it started when I um, g was studying at Yale. And it's really cool there. So, but it, it, it uh, kind of defined a lot of the things I, I'm doing currently in my work. Um, for example, I photograph a lot of my family members as this kind of, this is a photograph of my mom. And she's a frequent collaborator. Uh, I call it half self-portraits uh, when I make photographs of her because I share half my DNA with her. So a lot of the work of my family, um, this is my grandpa. This is a picture I can never make of my grandpa because he passed away by the time I made this picture. And it's a kind of a way to glean information I wouldn't, otherwise see of myself if I would were to photograph myself. Um, this is like his dentist, kind of makeshift dentistry office that he had in the, uh, the den, my childhood house. Um, my sister, um, I just, they, my family puts up with me a lot, yes. <laughs> uh, yeah, uh, that, that, they love me sometimes. Uh, and this is my sister laying on top of a coffee table that for some reason had a, this calendar girl image. Um, this one just was um, um, exhibited at the Brooks Museum in Memphis, and this is uh, one of my frequent collaborators. As much as I photograph myself, I photograph, I have a regular set of uh, cast members of my work, and um, often they, I call them up when I return and, uh, home and see if they want to do a shoot. Um, so much of what I photograph of myself is this kind of inventory of my mortality. It's also like uh, casting uh, how we all are aging as we go on. Um, 
people I found on the internet. Not the smartest thing um, to do, but you know, just to say, just to point that out. But they really were really cool. I really lucked out on them. Uh, and I just, this is all constructed, fake, but they were in a relationship at a time. Um, but I just really loved like this interjection with my body between them. Um, these are my friends, um, are twins, so they're like these identical twins. I think they're actually mirror twins, like one's right-handed and the other one's left-handed. Um, and my, my shadow self is split between them. Yeah. And then um, I, a part of this body of work was also photographing like these kind of diaristic um, uh, places that I grew up in Memphis. And I made this picture of the Lorraine Motel, which is now the Civil Rights Museum. Um, and that got really, uh, some classmates were not pleased that I made this picture because I, they felt I wasn't allowed to make this picture even though I grew up there. Um, but I was really interested in these spaces that are preserved. Um, this is Sun Studio where Elvis was discovered. And then also I used, I used an Elvis cardboard cutout. I was shooting with a four by five at the time. So I uh, had to have something to pull focus. So, and this was like my, my car buddy so I can um, drive in the fast lane. <laughs> I knew. And then this is like kind of ties into my now body of work where I make uh, cut, uh, photographs of myself um, that are cardboard cutouts. And so this is a cardboard cutout of me. And then I, it's been transforming into different materials. Like this is a real puzzle set. Um, a 3D printed mask of my face that my friend is wearing. It's like, He's, I got bored at work, so I just started putting my face everywhere. <laughs> my mom really, really was skeptical about this. <laughs> and giving, uh, and this is with my new camera, and giving my friend um, control of taking the picture, even though I am taking the picture. It's really, the shutter cord um, is not even connected to the camera, so. And then, yeah, and it's like a mask of my face in LA. And then I started really going into like oral, aura photography, um, spirit photography, and trying to make these unique um, prints that can't be easily replicated. This is like really small photograph, and it's, I like these unique objects. Um, temporary tattoos of my eyes on my face. I don't Photoshop. And then a puzzle of me and my mom in the same space, um, or occupying the same space, and our body, or where our body meets it, the top puzzle uh, alternates. And it's an installation I did of my first show, uh, solo show last May at the Camera Club in New York. Um, I also made a bust of myself. That was really scary. Sculpture is weird. This is a, for $25, you can get a, 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 a really bad Photoshop um, gift shop, um, green screen. You just get green screened in. And I really wanted to make a body of work that didn't involve me whatsoever, but had the themes of representation, image, depiction. So I started photographing Elvis impersonators. And this is um, the uh, black Elvis. He's really great, Robert Washington. These are real people. Um, I love like the photographicness of it. Um, like I can't. I'm not allowed to photograph or include images of Elvis because the estate owns his image, and so I have to get permission for that. Um, but he does have the special booth, um, Elvis special booth, because um, he ate there once, and so they put this plexiglass up. Um, these are two pictures of my friend's son Cooper, who's an aspiring. Um, ETA, Elvis Tribute Artist, and this is from last year, and this is from four years ago. And then more, it's like Jesus and God were met in the same room. It's really, this, it's just amazing. These guys are really, really fun um, to be around. And then I'll end it with like what I'm kind of working on is this, uh, my mom gifted me um, a photo album of her work that she did. So she fled, I'm Chinese ethnically and um, but my mom's generation was born in Vietnam, and we stayed after the fall of Saigon, so that was really um, these things I'm trying to uncover, like with these new things emerging that um, inherited trauma and things. 
Um, but she fled in 83 and made these, these small um, pictures that you see here um, in Canada in 1984. So she, I never knew about this, and she just gave this to me like four years ago. And I just really thought it was incredible work. Um, that's the passport of, that you saw earlier, my grandpa, and that's the same, his passport picture um, next to the first black and white picture in the album. And then it's mixed in with our collaboration where we're just really, like, I'm, she's allowing me time and space to photograph her. Um, and interjected with um, my travels in the South, this is a Polaroid I found in someone's shoebox in Florence, Alabama. Uh, muscle shells, the dam there. It's just like these toys just randomly gathered. One with really long hair. Um, queer figures are friends of mine that are living in the South and trying to find like these what really quiet moments in, involving color and this, the landscape and the people inhabit it. A lot of times I, I with this was done on a four by five, but I've just randomly street cast people that I meet that I find really interesting and just ask, um, ask them to photograph them. Chris Zipper. And then um, the new discovery is that, and growing up, I always thought I, I was, there was not a large Asian population in Memphis. So um, a few years back through a Food Channel episode about these guys, this is the, one of the Mississippi Delta Chinese group that's been there in, the, in deep South Mississippi since the 1920s. Um, and I never knew about them. So um, they have this amazing archive at the Delta State University. Um, and they've become my new collaborators. And this one's actually hanging upstairs. I'm still trying to um, make these new self-portraits of, of, of my, and trying to change it and continuously. And then I'll end it with a video. Hi. <laughs> Everybody, uh, thanks so much for having me here, Adara and uh, Natalie, and um, really excited. I, I love Tommy's work, and so I'm really excited to be up here with him. Um, I usually hide behind a podium when I do talks, so forgive me um, if I refer to my cheat sheet. Um, but yeah, so my name is Preston, and I'm an independent photographer based in San Francisco, and I, I split my time between. Uh, personal projects that are usually long form documentary projects, and then assignment work uh, for newspapers and magazines throughout the country. Uh, and I grew, oh, I guess I should flip, sorry, I forgot. I didn't, um, I didn't make notes that necessarily correspond, but I'll just um, try to remember to keep the visuals moving. This is just sort of a selection of different images uh, just kind of quick representational images of different projects I've done, different work through my career. So I grew up focused on art, but my professional background has been in community photojournalism. Um, and that's, there's, there's a lot of um, going back between um, art and journalism. That's very much, um, they're very connected for me and journalism um, informs a lot of the work that I do now. So I was raised in Charlotte, North Carolina, and this is actually um, one of these. I did a little project on the Civil War during the 150th 
you know, commemorative um, time. I think anniversary is not really the appropriate word, but um, when I was living in Norfolk, and this was a day camp for, you know, little kids, and they would either be um, Confederates or Union soldiers and reenact these little um, battle scenes, which is kind of bizarre. Um, but so I grew up in a part of the Old South in Charlotte where the community I grew up in, it, it sort of felt like everyone kind of looked the same, you know, like a lot of the girls were debutantes and a lot of the boys were sort of being groomed to work for their father's company. Uh, and I very much didn't fit in. And that was like early on, that was a very formative sort of part of my identity. Um, I was pretty good at drawing and painting. And so being an artist was one of my first sort of senses of self. Um, and it was during high school, I, I took my first photography classes in high school and I started migrating from art to photography as a teenager. Um, but I think one of the things for me, just my experience growing up, I was really left sort of craving for diversity. I just, I felt like I was surrounded by all these people who were like each other and not like me. And I think that's also been a huge influence on my work is just looking for just different people, you know? And I think that's been in a lot of ways, just a way that I've been able to kind of validate my own experience and my own identity. These last two are from an uh, urban farm uh, in Oakland, California. So after college, I sort of stumbled into newspapers. And it, it's sort of funny to think of now, but at the time in the early 2000s, newspapers were a pretty good way to make a living. Um, it was like fairly easy. There were some jobs around, you know, you could work your way up. And there was a way for me to be creative and still pay the bills. And so my parents, you know, were cool with that, and I got to take pictures every day. So it was it was great. And so I basically bounced around the country for about 12 years, working at different newspapers on staff, and I was really drawn to different places with you know distinctive cultural identities. Again, just sort of looking for that diversity, um, and just a different way to experience you know, different people and different people's lifestyles. This is from a, a judgment house, which is a conservative Christian sort of means of, um, you know, getting people into the church. Uh, it's sort of complicated to explain, but it's sort of a funny picture. Uh, so a lot of my work also, a significant amount, focuses on the LGBTQ community and um, a lot of that's personal work, but also by assignment work, which is really nice. Sometimes editors will hire me to shoot um, different you know, queer people. This was a personal project. Um, Kalisha was one of the youngest people at the Pulse nightclub during the shooting. And so I spent some time down in Orlando documenting her after like the, six, or the first year after the shooting. And then this piece is in uh, the Southbound Show. This is another um, photograph from a long-term project following Teddy on the right. Uh, and his boyfriend, Chris, came in toward the end. But just looking at you know, what it was like, this was 2012, 2013, um, you know, very different from now even. Um, but what it was like for you know, someone who's gay and you know, living in the projects and a conservative part of Virginia. Um, let's see, I'm getting ahead of myself. Um, but one of the things that I always try to look for is, you know, stories that challenge stereotypes and, you know, try to find people who represent, you know, a story that you don't normally hear or see in the media. And also trying to look at people in a more nuanced way and find characters who are more nuanced and complex. Uh, and my work still spans the country. I, you know, work in different places. I'm in California now, but, and I don't have any current projects in the South right now, but I very much want to be back here working at some point. Um, so I want to talk about this project real briefly. So my first 
big break in newspapers was at a newspaper called the Concord Monitor in New Hampshire. And um, it was there that I started this project uh, called the Remember Me Project. And it's now in its 15th year. So this boy in the center, uh, his name's EJ St. Pierre, and his mother, Carolyn, had terminal cancer. And so I was assigned to spend a couple of years, well, we ended up spending a couple of years with them for the paper um, as the family was dealing with her, you know, terminal illness. And, you know, I became, I worked with a writer and we both became really close with the family. And so we continued after Carolyn died and I'm still in touch with the family and still photographing EJ and the father, Rich. So it's been, you know, I'm hoping it's a lifelong project, actually. So it's in its 15th year now. Um, and, you know, looking at, it's, I mean, in some ways it's watching EJ grow up, but it's also exploring, you know, these themes of memory and loss and masculinity, what it's like for a boy to grow up in rural New Hampshire. He's very in touch, um, you know, he's got, he's got a really great, I think, expression of masculinity in a lot of ways, I really. Um, I'm constantly impressed with him. He's really into drama, which is nice. It makes it easier to photograph him because um, he doesn't mind being, you know, performing a little bit. But, you know, the work I do is almost all, you know, candid and documentary, so I don't stage um, or direct people. And a lot of my other work, or well, a lot of the work, one of the common threads is place and how um, individuals in the landscape <laughs> Uh, affect each other. So looking at that more and more. So it's rich. And just looking at time, you know, and how like in our lifetimes, just sort of exploring that as a theme. Okay, and so then the last project um, that I want to talk about is what's upstairs and or part of it. So from 2009 to 2012, I lived in Ocean View, which is a neighborhood in Norfolk, Virginia. And it's where I did this project that I call Between the Devil and the Deep Blue Sea. And I had just moved back to Virginia to work at the newspaper in Norfolk. And it was my actually my last job as a staffer. But I had been, um, I had been living around, this is funny, so I always, like to think that these girls like walk around like this every day um, but this was halloween and they were just kind of killing time until they could go trick-or-treating uh, but i had been prior to moving to this neighborhood i had been around you know i'd been in the west for a while and then i'd been in new england and new hampshire for a number of years and so i was really excited to be back in the south and i just happened to find this little cottage uh, for rent which was right on the water and, you know, I just, I fell in love with this neighborhood and, you know, it was just very diverse and quirky. There were lots of characters. Um, and, and I didn't know, I mean, I was also just so, so taken by what it was like to live on the water. I didn't realize that, you know, on a very modest middle-class salary, you could like rent a place on the beach, uh, at least in Norfolk, uh, which was really cool. And so I was just really um, inspired by, a lot of these are not, really exactly what I'm talking about, but <laughs> the snow scenes. Um, but, you know, looking at like the sky and the water um, and how that changes. And so I started out making landscapes originally uh, and then got more into telling, trying to tell some stories within the community, um, which was, you know, more in line with sort of what I had been doing um, as a photojournalist. Um, so let's see. Yeah, and so I lived and worked there for five years um, and then put a book together of that project. And yeah, so it, it's looking at, you know, this change in coastal community, this working class um, community and transition, and then also uh, the people's uh, relationship to the natural world. I think that's, oh no, I guess there might be a few more. I can't remember what I put in. Water baptism.
this was a dead fin whale that washed up and these guys were planking on it which was like an internet phenomenon like a number of years ago that I didn't even know at the time I had to google it but yeah so it's funny just bizarre you know looking for that sort of surreal yeah this one I think is upstairs as part of the southbound show yeah yeah so it's most of this work that's in the southbound um thing so yeah that's sort of a kind of a quick and dirty like career cap yeah thanks one of the things i'm struck by both the works that are in the southbound exhibition and even seeing the works um that you presented today um is that a lot of your images capture this um this sense of diversity that mirrors the idea of a new South, which is what is being presented upstairs. Um, but still, the communities, the situations, the people, et cetera, um, that you're depicting remain underrepresented, um, not only in the South, but in popular culture uh, throughout the America. So I was wondering if you could share a little bit more about um, the voices you made and the voices of people, the communities, um, and what you would show to represent. Go. Um, yeah, I mean, I think, you know, I, I mean, I think just generally diversity obviously is so important, and it's it's been increasingly something that I think a lot of us are aware of the lack of representation and diversity in mainstream media. Um, with the story I did on Teddy, it was very much a reaction to living in a place that was pretty conservative working for a newspaper that was pretty conservative. Um, and actually, they didn't end up running the story. They just, you know, for whatever reason that they decided, yeah, um, pulled the plug on it. And um, yeah, I just, I think that, I mean, for me, sharing stories is such a way that we get to know ourselves and each other. And it's just a fundamental part of human expression and, you know, those stories have to, you know, involve all of us as much as possible. Um, you know, I, th I think what's trickier is when you start thinking about like, well, who can tell whose story? Mm -hmm. um, and I would love to hear Tommy's take on that. Yeah, I guess. Well, I, I definitely I'm more interested in implicating myself in my own work. Uh, and I'm also been guilty of that. Like I. I wasn't so conscious like when I started out photographing and, and having other people help me collaborate on these uh, wacky ideas called art. Um, and then I think when the kissing pictures uh, started circulating, it was like on the early, I didn't know what I wanted from that project, but someone saw it and wanted to write about it. And there was like immediate backlash from the Asian community because of the uh, how I was uh, portraying myself was I always like have this deadpan expression that I was usually I seen it in painting a lot or when you sit down in early photography studios you have to sit for a really long time so you can't really express so much emotion um, and I thought it was more reinforcing these ideas of 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 those things and trying to be funny about making this work. And suddenly it was a sort of engaging in that um, conversation of this, anytime an, an Asian character does appear in a Western lens of Hollywood, it was always like neutered. Like they wouldn't even let Jet Li um, kiss Aaliyah, like it tested bad for audience. So there's these things that were still on the undercurrent that I wasn't so conscious of and then I realized like that is kind of what I'm trying to do and then when I cast people off the street or f strangers and friends and my other bodies of work it's uh I want to make I want to make pictures that don't deny their existence um, if I'm working with people um and I said something earlier about the um, the civil rights museum that I photographed um I think the argument that my classmate had and he was uh this I love him to death, but he's this white guy from Chicago. And it's just, he said, I'm not allowed to make those pictures because they don't know about black experience. And that's true. Um, and But I grew up 
there. And also, I think if I'm going to be photographing in the South, I have the responsibility to not deny other histories that are going on around me. So I think it's way worse to ignore um, other people's existence and their trauma and history in my own work if I'm photographing in the South, which I still am. You know. I mean, I think as, as Southerners, we're sort of another marginalized community, you know, in some ways, um, and a minority. I mean, and, you know, it's certainly in New England. <laughs> uh, you know, I had some interesting experiences where people would, um, you know, kind of put you down and, and make fun of, you know, the way you talk. And, um, yeah, so I think that, you know, for me, it's one other way. I mean, it's another like fundamental part of my identity, and it's also, you know, another way that sometimes people, you know, can treat you a little differently. Um, but you know, another thing that I think about a lot is now I feel like there's as much of a divide between rural and urban communities as like northern and southern, um, and so that's something that I've been sort of trying to explore a little bit more in my work um, with the New Hampshire stuff. Um, you know, growing up in rural New Hampshire is so different from growing up in like Oakland, California. I mean, I don't know if you can come up with much different places like in this country, but um, yeah, what do you think? Yeah, I, I mean, I always felt like out of place growing up because I didn't see, I don't think outside of my family, I didn't see another Asian person until I was seven or something. Like, that's out really rare. Even though there was like a historical of like, I didn't know about the Ch Mississippi Delta Chinese, but there was like a lot of um, immigration coming from the Southeast Asia, Vietnam, Laos, Laos and uh, Thailand and the Philippines. And during the 90s, and I never met any of them. And like, it's amazing to grow up where, I mean, in grade school is easier because we're just kids. And like, I went to an all black school and, and called Graceland Elementary. Um, in a area where it's called White Haven. Nick, colloquially, it's uh, nicknamed Black Haven because of white flight. Um, but that's, it was kind of a, the, one of the best experience I've, I've had um, looking back. Um, because I think those are the things that of my own concerns is this intersection, intersectionality of um, being queer, being from the South, being Asian, but being specifically Chinese, but also Vietnamese, but also being, I don't know, left-handed. It's, it's, there's a lot of these differences that don't exist at the same time in the art world. And it's kind of amazing to um, being able to contribute that um, at the same time. I even, I think, had, uh, looking back, when I moved to New York, there was like one photographer that looked like me and was like made pictures in the 80s. And he was so far the only, um, like I think he's one of two um, Asian photographers, Asian American photo photographers, in that I know about. That's been canonized. That's in history books. That's like in like pretty big museums. Um, but it's so odd to not have. There should be more. Right? There should be more in the past. Um, but I don't know. There's just I I keep looking, but there's not. Yeah. So do you think that somebody not I I think there's enough seats at the table to uh, have different perspectives. I think uh, doing agreeing to do the, the this this I, I I was this was presented to me as a survey show. I'm not sure how they um, approached it to you, Preston, but. I, I was really into the idea because I think that was the first, like, for me um, personally to be identified as a seven photographer than anything else. And I was like, oh, that's super cool. Like, I hope they picked the ones I actually made in the South. Um, and they did. Uh, I was like, I'm always self-conscious. Like, I'm not enough um, of, of these things because of having to always answer to uh, an identity that, um, or a community that doesn't necessarily accept me. Like, I... 
um, don't have a larger gay community in, in New York City, of all places. Um, I'd like to, but I'm more interested in interacting with different um, people that share similar backgrounds for me, so. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, I think it's interesting. A lot of the Southbound photographers aren't from the South. I don't know what the numbers are, but I think a significant percentage um, have just worked worked in the South. Um, but yeah, I would tend to agree. Like, I think it's tough when you start saying you can or cannot, you know, do something. Or, um, but I think, you know, I, I mean, in my work, I try to really approach it with you know, being sensitive and showing people with dign dignity and humanity and, you know, nuance. And I think that that's partly from growing up in the, in the South and knowing, um, having to fight those um, conceptions that other people have outside of the South. And I think that, you know, that might be something that a lot of us have in common um, is, you know, because we feel like we're complicated people, you know, we can't be distilled into some sort of stereotype. Um, so I think that there's, you know, a lot of us do approach work in that way. Yeah, I mean, I love the way that you, I, I can never, uh, I don't think, I, I'm just a shy person, if, if you can believe that. Uh, and I just love the way, like, you, we work with so many large groups of people and communities and have these, like, relationships. And a lot of mine, I feel, is almost like the opposite because it's very temporal and very um, like ethereal. Like I'm just, I hit people's peripheries and then I just uh, go away for a few months to work in New York because I live in New York and my job's there. But it's having, I can't really work in, I, can't, I don't like photographing in New York because it's all fashion, it's all street photographers that got a camera at age six, Stephen Shore. Um, I was like, wow, I never had that opportunity. And but it's there's something in New York that I am drawn to for work wise. But being at home in the South, there's so much to unpack. And I think part of my process is like I have a finite time that I spend with my family and friends, and then going around photographing of these places that are really fleeting at the same time. Like this, you say urbanization earlier, and I think there's like going back to Memphis particularly, it's a, a lot of things have been changing or like being replaced and sub, subbed in and I'm still trying to uncover this, this truth that I'm not sure how to define that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think a lot of us too have maybe a different relationship with history um, than people in other parts of the country because it's so ingrained in who we are um, in a very complicated way. Um, but I know growing up in Charlotte, I felt like there was very little history. I mean, everything was just sort of corporate and like just constantly, you know, being turned over. Um, and that was another thing that made me kind of want to be in a place that wasn't like that. Um, you know, it just as a reaction to the place that I grew up in. Yeah. Um, can I ask a question? Yeah. Um, both of you reference diversity as a, as a major um, definition in your work, I think, in a certain sense, either indirectly or directly. Um, how would you, would both of you mind defining what it means to you? For diversity? Right. What diversity means to me? Um, I think for me, diversity is um, seeing people that are not like me. And I'm surrounded by that a lot more in New York. But I'm a, I feel like I get surrounded by all types of people with different experiences. And like I don't necessarily have to empathize but or sympathize. But it's kind of amazing that all these complex experiences exist around me and that I will never, ever kind of body their experiences and I think that's okay um, and I think that's diversity for me and seeing people who look like me seeing people who are having an authentic voice and where it just as there's there, that it's a that they're hopefully one day that there's enough narratives of, of different all kinds of people that it becomes not an issue anymore 
Yeah, I mean, I think diversity takes many different forms. Um, but, you know, for me, it's, you know, minority groups, I guess, you know, in some ways. Um, and that could be in, in from one location, you know, looking for this, you know, people who are having slightly different experiences and different histories than the majority of people in an area. Um, but I think, you know, economic diversity, class diversity, I think is like really important and something that I look for um, in work. Um, yeah, I think, you know, political diversity, I think is really important um, too. That's even more of an issue now, um, but trying to just, you know, incorporate different voices. Um, yeah, but just have, I mean, I think the goal for me is to, and not necessarily just in the work I do, but just generally just to have different stories and different people represented, right? So, I mean, when I grew up, I felt like there weren't, I didn't know many gender non-conforming people um, unless they were like really athletic or something, and I was not that. Um, so, you know, and I didn't know that many queer people. And so just, you know, I think that it's, it's important for people to grow up knowing, you know, no, seeing themselves in other places and portrayed in a real way um, in the media. Thank you. Mm -hmm. So how do you find the role of the photographer uh, in that kind of discovery, that presentation? So how do I define like the, my role as a photographer? Um, I don't know. I mean, honestly, a lot of, you know, when I think about it, a lot of it for me is just personal enrichment. You know, I just would rather get to know different people. And um, and the work that I do, a lot of it is, you know, very intimate and I'm in different people's houses and in their lives. And it's just such a privilege just to be able to see how other people live their lives. Um, and, you know, so I, I feel, you know, definitely I'm aware of that. And then, you know, I think it's very much a collaboration. I think that's really important. Um, you know, it's tricky in journalism, you know, there's this saying of like giving voice to the voiceless, which I always thought was a little weird. And, you know, I think now people are starting to realize, yeah, that's not, you know, that's not a good way to put it. Um, but I do think like just witnessing, you know, people, people want to be heard and seen. I just think that's also a fundamental thing. Um, about human nature. And I think that's some of what I do too, is just, you know, I'm aware of you. I think you're important. I think it, you know, when you photograph something, it imparts value on it. Um, so I think that's, that's another kind of key part of my role as a photographer. Yeah, as much as I, I don't, uh, I mean, I don't, I guess like I don't really photograph as many people on subject matter that, um, that, that, need, that you do. Um, and when I do for myself, like I think the the cardboard cutouts and the mask on my face has been really something I um, really I was like I was I was kind of proud of like that arrival to that idea. It's not an original idea because um, Rika Racinger um, is also another photographer that did these cardboard cutouts and. And she also went to Yale, and I like waited for years because I was just like, I don't feel like I want to arrive there, but I don't want to feel like I'm like stealing her idea. And you know, I talked to her and a couple of friends, and it's just like, okay, cool. Um, no, in my head, no. I just like it's it's hard to uh, give myself permission, and especially I don't think I'm the best ambassador to other people's um, experiences. Um, a lot of my work is about humor and performance and the idea that what's photographed is this, um, these depictions are already influenced by these Western ideas. Like why I like certain things is because like, well, I grew up with those Western things, like looking at them for a really long time. Um, and with the cutouts, uh, like once I started finally doing them, uh, it really felt I could actually control my own image. Like the process is all in camera. I make, I pre-plan these like um, um, poses and gestures with the when I make the cutouts, and then like send them off. And as these photographs, and they're transformed into these like um, amazing standees that are easy to transport. TSA ask a lot of questions. 
Um, then I'm just, I'm fine. It's just weird. Um, and it's like, it's for art. Um, and I think there's like a really amazing understanding when I explain these projects and like not in the context of art that they're, uh, people kind of get it. Um, but for me, being a photographer and my own subject matter, it's like, I don't want to necessarily photograph myself straight on, but these cutouts are these photographs of myself, photographs of photographs. And I'm trying to get back that agency. Like, I just, I've never felt comfortable photographing myself. And that isn't like a, some sort of act or some sort of like construct. Um, so it's always like this really going back and forth, like with myself. And I think that was one of like the really big breakthroughs. Mm -hmm. And it seems like humor, I mean, that's one of the things when I was looking at Tommy's work last week or earlier in the week, um, getting ready for this, you know, I, my work isn't nearly as funny. Um, but, you know, I do think that is a little something that we have in common. And, and, I would, and it seems like that's a way, common way that people who feel different maybe break down barriers. Is that something that you've thought about? Kind of. I like, I like the grouping of things like humor. I particular use is a way, like definitely for the human experience. And um, I think it's, uh, I use it in like, I think people can understand humor a lot more. And I was in Miami a few years ago for residency and I was walking through a museum and there was like this little title card and it was like explaining the saying and it was like, well, the, this curtain piece is based on the drama, Greek drama where you, the happy face and the sad face were um, this manifestation of tragedy and, um, and comedy. And they, Greeks believed that those were the basis of human experience. And it was like, fuck. <laughs> it really blew my, sorry, I cursed. <laughs> I'm from flat Tennessee. Um, but yeah, I think, I, I don't know. I see like the humor, but I, I think there's just as importance with your work of being, closer to the truth and being a photojournalist or being at this documentary um, is I, I straddle between them. I don't like defining, like my, some of it's con constructed and a lot of my work just is on the whim improv. Like, and I'd never have a formula for it because it's just, it gets boring once I start those rules for myself, but I like to be as confusing about it. But I think there's a lot more authenticity to the work that we're both doing a lot more review because it's a straight on and it's about these real things happening. Yeah. Um, I'd also be curious to know how do you, how did you find the people in Return to Sender? Bars. Yeah. <laughs> no, um, they start. Yeah, it is. Um, no, I started out with um, my uh, studio mates, and when I had a studio in Brooklyn and. Then it started branching out to casting friends of friends and um, strangers just carry the camera and the tripod with me to um, parties and just like explain the project. And then, yeah, not a lot of them said no. <laughs> uh, so um, I think there was some enjoyment, I guess, on their end. But I, I didn't. I mean, I was I was there for work. Yeah. <laughs> N no. <laughs> it was very diverse group. I, it's a, yeah, and I think that was something that evolved from like this representation and like the Asian community was really mad at me for a while. And then I was like, well, you're not wrong. So, and then I started including more and more um, people of like different, like I realized I was not, I was like casting people I was comfortable with. And then like, uh, like last, I say halfway in, I just like, oh, no, I need to really find different people that interest me and I need to stop being shy because this is this this is really not, I'm not paying attention a lot more, so. Mm -hmm. yeah. And Preston, how do you find the communities that you're, especially in the works that are on display upstairs? Uh, let's see, what's upstairs? It's Teddy and Chris. I met Teddy at a, at a ball um, and, and then just approached him about doing that story. Um, let's see, the, the family in the tent, actually, it was funny, there was, a, um, there was a Latino family that had this really cool construct that they had built on the beach, and I wanted to photograph them when I was out there shooting that day, 
and they turned me down and I always remember the the things when you get turned down and then but but then I made another picture that like I you know love just as much so so that's the, the African American family in in the tent um, and then I, the watermelon um, photograph too the I pulled over because the watermelon salesman looked interesting but he wouldn't let me photograph them for some reason and so I just photographed the two watermelons like there on the um, on the chair. Uh, but yeah, I mean, it's also interesting, I think, you know, having worked in different parts of the country, um, you know, and, and certainly when I was working for a newspaper, I mean, like every day I'd have to go out and ask people if I could photograph them. But, you know, people are different in different parts of the country. And I think the South, um, people are, are more open. I mean, I think it's a really great place to work, which is another thing about, you know, shooting in the South is, I just think people are just, I don't know, they're just more open. Um, California's tough, and I think the Northeast can be tough. Um, yeah, but I mean, a lot of times, I mean, the way I find people is just, most of the time, it's kind of a natural sort of organic thing. Um, Callie, who was the Pulse survivor, is one of the only stories I've done successfully where I was like, I want to find a person in this group, you know, and I like went through um, an organization and they helped connect me to her. Are there any questions? Kind of a question, question. So the picture with EJ, it was named EJ. Mm -hmm. I think the last one you showed, he was sleeping and it looked like there was a female hand. Mm -hmm. Was that his mother or was that like, did, did his dad get remarried? Yeah, so that's um, his dad's new partner. Yeah, who um, she's been five, seven years, seven or eight years, I think they've been together now. Um, yeah, because he was really, he was a toddler when his mother died. Uh, and I've, I've had kind of gone back and forth about, you know, having her in the project. She's also a little bit more reticent about being photographed. It's a little awkward because it's largely inspired by, you know, the ex. Um, so it's a little tricky in that way. But I also kind of like, like the idea of, of her, you know, of having sort of a female presence but not an explicit one you know but yeah that's who that is so and she was checking to see if he had a fever because he was sick yeah, yeah. Um, um as a fellow queer southerner i wonder if you guys can talk about what it was like to leave the south and how that informed your identity but also your own no no since yeah um uh, <laughs> uh, well, I think I, I studied art in, in art school in Memphis, and it was it, when I did this residency in 2010 in New York City, it's like before then, everything was informed by two things, Law and Order and I Love Lucy. That was my idea of New York City. <laughs> um, and it really, it's something, um, to that it the whole seeing art in person i like actually got to see a like dn arbus photograph like and that changes me um and now I, I live there i've after yale i like moved um to new york city just because i didn't think like i would be i would have a job that i'd be happy with in memphis going back um and i would and the thought of like going back to memphis um making work didn't really hit hit me quite yet because I was still like like you know going through therapy for like the grad school experience of, of Yale it's like it was intense but it was awesome but also like uh, <laughs> like I have lost sweaty hands um, but I think it was a lot of like having there's actually a lot of Memphis expats we call ourselves Memphis expats in New York City and so there's a lot of people from back home that um, we just catch up and and never left. And there's oftentimes like being in New York, they like being from the South is what's most very interesting about me. And sometimes people, my my neighbors would just like hear the Southern accent and then they either would make fun of it um, because like, I don't know, this Northern microaggression and <laughs> something, it's just, there is something really 
like defensive about when I come to like I just really really go all out with my southern accent or go really Asian uh, or kind of like logically I should go really gay but um, that hasn't really um, happened yet uh, I, I don't know there's uh, it's kind of it does make me a lot more uh, like very more unique in this in the city out there and then but and I'll come back home a lot so yeah, I think you know, I guess I, I felt like I became more of a southern when I left, you know, because then you, you realize how you know, might be different from other people. Um, and then, yeah, I think with the queer thing, it was just the intersection intersectionality. Um, is, you know, it's just sort of who, you know, what the things that make us unique, right? Um, and I think that that's important when it comes to making art is exploring like who you are and you know what what you want to say. Um, but yeah, I mean, I think it's you know it's a like I said it's a double minority. Um, I mean, I you know I'm white, so I don't have the you know the ethnic perspective. Um, but you know, as a woman, you know, I think about that a lot, for sure. Um, yeah, but I, you know, I also tend to seek out other Southerners in other places. Like I have a number of friends who are Southern and living elsewhere. Yeah. Well, living where wherever I am, um, because I do think you've got that. I don't know. I think there's a lot of the Southerners that I know outside of the South are like really just kind of down to earth and yeah, they um, get it. Yeah, they they get it. It's like if I'm this is more funny antidote to this. Uh, it's like, they understand, like, I really need a biscuit. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Although now everybody does fried chicken and biscuit, fried chicken and waffles, and I'm kind of like, uh, it's like, come on. Come on, something a little more easy. So just go to the South and do it. It's like, this is terrible. <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah, um, I think that what's it been like following the following one story for 15 years? Not a lot of photojournalists really get to do that ever. It's kind of photograph and move on. Um, what, what's it been like following that, watching EJ grow up? Yeah, it's been great. I mean, I, I love working on that project. I wish I could spend more time working on it. I think, you know, the most challenging thing is being in California, you know, and it takes a day to get there and, you know, a thousand bucks or whatever. Um, so, you know, I only make it back a couple of times a year generally. But, um, but it's, it's really great. I mean, I'm sort of like a, like an aunt, you know, in the family, like, you know, he's, it's funny. I think about, so one of the biggest challenges is like physically getting there, but also just staying in touch is hard, you know, when I've got all this other stuff going on. And I was, I do audio interviews with him now, uh, once a year, which is also really interesting and a really good way for us to kind of bond. Um, and for me just to get to know sort of like his headspace, like at that moment. But he was talking about something and I was like, oh, was that recent or was that a long time ago? He was like, oh yeah, that was a long time ago. That was like three months ago. And I was like, oof, I need to text him more often. You know, just the time frame that he thinks in is just so much shorter because his life has been shorter. Um, it's just interesting how time changes when you get older. Uh, but yeah, I mean, I think it's just been a really fun project to work on and, uh, and then, you know, also interesting to try to, you know, as I evolve as an artist and as a photographer, trying to make work that still feels connected to the early work, but also is work that I'm proud of and moving in the direction that I want to move into. So yeah, I mean, I hope to put a book together this year if I can, um, cause I think it's, it's ready to kind of find a physical form, so that's something I'm going to focus on this year. Yeah. So you, you, you would have a, a little tell when it comes to talking about that family in Hampshire, where you constantly talk about what it must be like to grow up in rural New Hampshire. Uh -huh. That's clearly kind of impressed you, that whole dynamic. Uh -huh. How does it look and feel different than growing up in a rural town in the South? How much does this regionality play? Yeah, I think it's very similar. Um, and that's one of the things that I think is so interesting now that, you know, and someone else pointed this out to me recently, I can't remember where, um, but I think growing up in rural New Hampshire is very much like growing up in rural North Carolina. 
Um, you know, and I didn't grow up, I grew up in Charlotte, so, you know, we're sort of I mean, on the bubble a little bit, but, you know, the small towns in New England are pretty different. Um, yeah, but I think it is very similar, you know, lots of, you know, gun culture is big, and that's, you know, very different for me. I didn't grow up with that. Um, yeah, I'm sorry, what, the question was just like, what is it? I was just wondering if you, if you were impressed by it because of how different it was, mm. how similar it was, or if there were other distinctions that you found when you were up there doing that work in the Cold Wars. Yeah, I mean, in terms of like my personal feelings about it, I think he's more connected. I think people in rural places are often more connected to the natural world, uh, which I think is really great and really important. You know, he loves to fish. And, you know, he was talking about studying like marine biology. And, you know, I think, you know, he's out. I mean, he plays video games all the time, too. But he's also outside a lot. Um, but, you know, I think the flip side of that, you know, and there's definitely, in some ways, it feels a little like Norman Rockwell-ish. You know, he's like, he and his father, like, do Boy Scouts together. And, um, you know, sometimes it's a little like, oh, that's a little, it feels a little too much like growing up in the 1950s. Um, and, you know, but the biggest flip side to, um, I think, sort of his experience is that there's not much diversity. Um, New Hampshire's gotten better, but it's still, you know, I mean, every, we talk about with the primaries, I mean, it's a very white state. And in the rural areas, it's even more more white. So, um, you know, I think I would like to see that change because I think, you know, if you're exposed to more of a monoculture, it just, you know, just sort of, it keeps you just away, you know, it's just nice to broaden your horizon some. Yeah, but I generally do think that the rural communities there are very similar to the ones in the South. Being from New Hampshire, I was wondering where you, where you live. Oh yeah, where are you from? Uh, my my parents were born upstate, 30 miles from the Canadian border. Culver uh, grew up to Lancaster, Wakefield. Oh cool. Yeah, so I was in Concord. Okay. Yeah, so that's where I worked. So in Concord is the capital, so it's sort of it's not the biggest city in New Hampshire, but you know, you know, it's a it's it's a significant size, small city. Uh, but there's a lot of small towns around and spent a lot of time around there. And that's where EJ lives now. He grew up in Concord, but then they moved out to one of the smaller towns not that long ago. I'm really curious as to your approach. Are you guys typically, are you typically looking at moves, chasing subjects, emotions? How are you approaching your work? Um, for, well, I have like the, I work on different bodies of work and projects. Um, for the Elvis, every for the Elvis impersonators, tribute artists, um, I come back to them about once a year. So because they always converge in August uh, for Elvis's uh, the anniversary of Elvis's death, um, and it's kind of like just been slowly befriending a lot of them. And and most years I don't ever meet the same Elvis um, tribute artist. Um, yeah, other subjects are kind of like on a whim. I just meet um, for the kissing pictures. A lot of them are just now random, and now I just am kind of starting to um, depart from the rules and start casting like actual actors and models to see if there's like a nuance to this performance piece. Um, other times it's just like pulling from the street, like I see someone that has that I wanted to get to know more photographically. And I like to re come back and photograph them again is my hope because I think um, having making one photograph of them isn't a very telling thing. And I, I, I enjoy a lot um, having a regular cast of people that just continuously expand. So. And my family puts up with me. Yeah, no, I'm impressed by that. I can't photograph my family, really. Yeah. My grandma has run away. <laughs> <laughs> That's great. Um, yeah. um, Kristen and Tommy, I, just, I want to thank you so much for coming to the Hunter, spending your evening with us, and being so open. Um, the exhibition is open upstairs, and uh, both Tommy and Kristen will be upstairs um, to answer questions if there's any additional questions.
Thanks so much. Yeah, thanks Thank for coming.